Welcome to the Alouette's Flight Deck podcast dedicated to Montreal Alouette's football, presented by Sport Buff. I am your host, Tim Capper, along with Cliff D. Hey, Cliff, how are you, man? Doing good. Living the dream as always. Living the dream, and finally, something we have to look forward to in the city of Montreal, not just on television itself. But yes, no matter what the Alouettes said in, in their, uh, <laughs> on their little five reasons to come to the game this Friday, for the first time in 656 <laughs> days, the Alouettes are going to have a home game. Can't wait. Should be fun. And they're, they're, uh, they're announcing quite a bit of stuff that uh, I actually didn't expect. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty pumped. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. We've got to talk about the game here. And, um, and also this week, we will be speaking with uh, Matthew Prue uh, with RDS, uh, Alouettes champ. Um, we'll find out more about him when we do speak with him. Uh, first and foremost, I want, I've already mentioned, we mentioned it on social media today, Cliff, uh, that we have extended our partnership with Sport Buff. Mm-hmm. We're actually very pleased to have been able to do that with, uh, with Chris and Gary. Um, as I, as I've mentioned before, and yeah, I know this has turned into an ad, but it had, what didn't mean to, but I mean, Again, if as we said before, if you know the the, the name, it is a it is a Montreal historical icon. Um, I, I I honestly think that it goes up into there into the names with Gibby's and and other places like that uh, for stores, whether it's still around or not. But I mean, it's it, it's one that was around for a while and it was very very well known. But again, we're 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 very pleased to be partnering with them again. And uh, stay tuned, stay tuned. That's all I can say. That's true, because uh, with the extension of this partnership, that means more giveaways for you folks. So uh, if you're not subscribed, if you're not uh, following us on Twitter or any other social medias, get on that because we're going to have swag giveaway yet again. Yes, sir. And by the way, great segue. Thank you very much there, Cliffy D. (laughs) Speaking of Twitter, and and for those of you who've been listening to this show, you may have remembered me saying something like this, making a promise. The promise has finally come true. We did reach and we unlocked our goal. We got to the next level. We won up and we got to 600, 600 now plus followers on our Twitter account over, over at Alouette's FL deck. So very shortly, we will be announcing uh, the item that we're going to be giving away and the winner. And the winner will be based off of all of our followers. That's right. So something something to give out to you guys for being... Uh, you know, loyal followers. Whether you started following us today or whether you started following us from day one, doesn't matter. So oh, everybody is eligible, and we definitely appreciate all of you becoming a part of our Alouettes flight crew, if you will. Yes, sir. So you know, we appreciate the follows. We appreciate all the support. Uh, by all means, keep listening. Keep telling friends. Keep telling your family. Keep telling everybody about the Alouettes flight deck because. As I've said numerous times, we are here for you. We are here to entertain and inform each and every one of you that's listening. So, make sure you're tuned in to us. Uh, like I said, we're we're very we're very approachable. We're very, you know, excited to be able to present these uh, news and thoughts and opinions and everything to you guys. So, uh, please, by all means, stay tuned to the Alouettes okay. Flight Deck. And lastly, in order to uh, unlock another uh, uh, another giveaway, uh, head over to well. Yeah, the, Best way is to just go over to YouTube, search for Alouette's Flight Deck. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you do so because we have a couple. Of, we have a couple of our full episodes listed there already. Um, if we can get ourselves to a hundred followers, we will uh, that will unlock that other glorious giveaway. So, and so that the, right now the only way is to search for Alouette's Flight Deck when you go into Twitter. There is no specific URL at the moment. As we're trying to get for a hundred four, make it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. You know, it's better than saying youtube.com slash ABC one eight three four eight underscore underscore eighty six thirteen seven. Um so Yeah. Not as doesn't roll off the tongue as nicely. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it'd be a lot easier. Alowitz flight deck or Alice flight deck, whatever choices we're given. Mm-hmm. So go ahead and go go to the YouTube page and uh, subscribe. So Cliff, um uh, the game this week were we You know, with the news that we heard that came out of the Calgary camp about Bo Levi not starting, do you think Al's fans were a little bit overconfident going into the game? No, not the team itself, because we really can't speak to how the guys were feeling once they heard Bo Levi wasn't going to start. 
But do you think fans were just a touch overconfident? I tried to curtail it a little bit, but I felt we had a better chance than we did without Bo Levi starting, and we saw what happened. But what are you, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, and ironically, it would have been better probably for the Alouettes had Bo Levi Mitchell started because uh, he's only ever won one game versus the Montreal Alouettes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know what it, why that is. It's just you know bad luck or you know the you know every time it seems to be mostly too the most of his losses coming at uh, in Montreal. Uh, I mean he's just uh, it seems to be snake bitten. So like uh, I was in a small way disappointed when uh, Bo Levi wasn't going to be in the lineup against Montreal. Uh, instead we get uh, Jake Meyer, which also too was a surprise because mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. thought it would be the uh, Canadian kid Michael O'Connor getting the nod, but. Uh, Kind of funny. It brought me back to 2015, I think it was, when uh, Montreal played Calgary at home. And we had a similar situation where our star quarterback was knocked out of out, out for injury. And we had a choice between a young Canadian quarterback that had quite a bit of promise and a complete unknown. And the coaching staff with, went with a complete unknown. Do you right. remember this, Tim? Uh, you, are you we? See where I'm going? We're thinking. I, well, I'm thinking here. I think you're talking. Well, Brandon Bridge versus was it Rakeem Cato? Correct. Woo woo! And remember what happened during that game? Nobody knew Rakeem Cato from Rakeem Cato from a hole in the wall, unless right. he went to Marshall University and or was following college football really hard down down in the states. But he came in and lit up Calgary like a Christmas tree. Yep. And it was a very exciting game. Uh, you know, like and Calgary just simply had no response for for the Montreal Alouettes that day. This yeah. past Friday, now I'm not comparing Jake Meyer or Mayer, or however the hell you pronounce his name, to Rakeem Cato. I mean, you're, you're really comparing apples and oranges with that one, but this was another situation. Like, history, you know, a small way was kind of repeating itself with a relatively unknown quarterback. Right. Never played a down in the, in the Canadian Football League. Just came in. Uh, it was a little shaky at first, but... I mean, he got the job done. I mean, he managed well over 300 passing yards against the Alouettes. Uh, just made them look foolish for the most part. Uh, you know, from the second half, from the second half uh, you know, onwards. I mean, it was just uh, it, it was incredible to see what he did against this Montreal team. That I truly think came into this match just a little overconfident as well. Never mind the fans. I mean, the fans are the fans, but. I, I can't help but feel like the Alouettes were looking at this game as a gimme, especially with Bo Levi out of the mm-hmm. lineup. Yeah, and I mean it. There were a lot of things that really led to the to the downfall of the Alouettes this past week. And, and for those who, you know, had had been following, you know, what 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 was happening in the game itself, or you happened to miss part of it. But I mean, it's you know, final score was uh, Calgary twenty eight, Montreal twenty two. Um, it, it it ended ba- with the with the Owls on the one yard line, basically. Uh, it's we, we've seen this before in the past where the Owls get. They're up. They get down again. They, then they make a frantic comeback. Uh, a la Winnipeg. We we'll get that. That's a good example. Um, but yeah, th- I, I just think that you know, Gina Lewis was not able to have that ball break the plane, and you know, the Owls would have won this won this game for mm-hmm. sure. I mean, they would have won this game uh, if he had caught that in, in the end zone. But um, yeah. it, you know, it is what it is. But but the thing is, you really can't just look at that one play though, because there were many things within the game itself, Cliff, that really led to this downfall and it and you know they talk about ts and turning points and they talk about you know what went wrong with the alouettes you know they were there were quite a few things that went wrong i mean what i thought was funny by the way is how this game the beginning of this game almost mimicked exactly how the edmonton game started Mm -hmm. exactly including a dropped int inside the 10 yes indeed (laughs) i mean what i mean it (laughs) Boy, th- those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Hey, well, we were, it's very possible that it was going to, you know, oh, it's same start in the same way, you know, we're, I was going to win. Da, da, da. No, it, it could have been that way. And there was there was a turning point for this game. There was. And it's so, so funny because you're absolutely right. The the Alouettes, it looked like a carbon copy, like cut and paste yeah. of the, the previous game. I mean, Vernon looked cool, calm, collected, even when he coughed up the ball you know, marching towards the end zone uh, during the, I think it was his first or second drive. The Alouette still managed to recover. And aside from that miscue, for the most part, he looked poised. He looked, he looked the same as he did versus Edmonton, like no stress, no, no worries. Like he just, he went about his business and did his job. And 
you know, the Alouettes go up 14 to three at, at one point. Yeah. And this, this game looked like it was a, you know, a, a, a done deal, a fait accompli, if you will. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I agree. Um, but unfortunately, that's that's not what happened. To me, the turning point, and I think you and I both agree with this, is the interception thrown by VA in the second quarter, which then driving where it could easily have been 21 to three, yep. easily have been 21 to three. But from yeah, that, that point, from that point on, they did. They had nothing going until late in the fourth. Nothing. Yeah, absolutely nothing. Like like anything that could go wrong did go wrong for the Alouettes. Whether you're talking about that interception, you're talking about uh, two and outs, a plenty, uh, penalties. Uh, just, I mean, they just completely fell apart. That's really what it came down to. And you, you look like TSN would also pan over to the sidelines, and you'd look at the you know the players are trying to talk to one another, and there's just scowling and a lot of you know. A lot of yelling back and forth. It looked like there was some finger pointing as well. I mean, it was just like this did not look like that wonderful cohesive unit that we've come to expect from this team. Like it just looked like a train wreck, quite mm-hmm. frankly. Yeah, and, and again, from from that point on, uh, Hamilton, excuse me, uh, Edmund, Calgary, Cal- uh, thinking this week, uh, just outplayed them. They just outplayed them. Yeah, I mean. They got taken to the woodshed by yeah. uh, an unknown quarterback. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, again, they were outscored. Uh, it was 20, 25 to 8 for the rest of the game. I say it came close. You know, they all still led in the third quarter. But, again, there's that one turning. But still, in my opinion, before we get to the to the stats, which, you know, really don't. They, they say a lot, but it doesn't show really about with the game itself, what happened with the game. Mm-hmm. There were there were still a few things that caused this downfall, and and you and I were talking about this on social media during the game, and, and just after, it just seemed for first and foremost, I don't know if you saw it. I'm trying to remember what quarter it was. I think it was in the first quarter or midway through the second. Did you see that one point where VA all of a sudden started shaking his hand as if he had smacked it on a helmet or something? I did. Yes. What was your thought? Because they showed the replay, and he didn't hit anything. No, nothing but air. So I, I don't know if it was just a spasm, it is like, a, a, like a muscle spasm or what. But uh, yeah, that was kind of weird, and everybody picked up on it too. Like the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the play-by-play had noticed it as well and you know, wondered what had happened. They thought maybe he did smack a helmet or something like that. But uh, upon the replay, it was like no, he he was nowhere near anyone's helmet. So maybe it was just a phantom injury. <laughs> it's not just a fluke. It's, who knows? It was. It was very weird though to see him kind of shaking his hand and kind of favoring it just a little bit. Yeah. Now, after that, and it seemed early on in the game versus Edmonton, but after that, something was a little off. Whether it was the routes being run or VA was either underthrowing or overthrowing the wide receivers. Because if you look at the stats and you see the amount of targets that some of our guys got versus how many catches they got, it really does speak volumes on on. I, you know, if you hadn't watched the game itself, that would you would look at it and say, "Well, wait a minute, what's going on?" Some just seemed off with VA. I don't know what it was, um, but I would think, and it, and it leads to the last play of the game. VA, and we don't know what the route was, but VA's pass to Gino just on the cusp of the end, of the end zone was short. Mm-hmm. It was not in the end zone where it should have been. Because everybody who plays football knows if you're as long as the ball touches the pylon, it's good. Yep. You know, it's like one of the passes earlier in the game. Remember the pass from Vernon where it actually smacked? <laughs> he missed the wide receiver, but he hit the pylon dead on. He did. That's, that should count for something. It should have. <laughs> Half a rouge? I should, I, I'd even go a full rouge at that point. Well, we're, we're, we're creating a new scoring play. It's called a, it's called a don't. So that, <laughs> I don't know how many points we should give it, but... Um, but yeah, what what were your thoughts, Cliff? I mean, as I said uh, before, we get into one of the, the the other big thing that really cost the Owls. I mean, did you see anything? Any other issues with, with VA and, and how he was playing? I think just a, a lot of his decision making was just off. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, they show I, again in the heat of the moment. I understand you you make your reads and you you go with what you think is going to be the best option. But there was a lot of times where they he had a receiver wide open and he completely missed them and instead going to and throwing the ball into traffic and. To me, it was like, okay, you're, why? So, and either the 
pass would be either incomplete or sometimes caught. But uh, I mean, it's, like some of the decisions were just bizarre more than anything else. Uh, and then they got away from the ground game as well. Oh God, don't don't I'll, don't die. <laughs> I, I mean, don't don't get me wrong. William Sandback still nearly got a hundred yards rushing, but I mean, you know could have been more and you probably should be especially too when you're having when you're just not clicking and that's what it was it just didn't feel like he was clicking with any of the receivers at that point you go to your ground game you go to your your workhorse and stand back and like i said he, in a losing effort he still managed to get to rack up 82 yards i mean that's that's not terrible for no. a, a player of his skill and he, he would have gotten more if you, you gave it a little bit more attention i mean calgary's run defense you know they did the job for the most part but i mean they you know eventually you would Stanback would have wore them down. I'm pretty sure of that. I, uh, for for me, it, it just felt baffling why why Vernon would make some of the throws that he was making. Like it just felt like he'd go through his reads and just didn't like he he zigged when he should have zagged kind of thing. It was it was very confusing to say the least. Like it, to me, it looked like this, something doesn't look right. Like I mean, like as far as his decision making goes, I know he's better than that. Yeah, and it just it wasn't showing right there. He just looked kind of lost out there at times it's true because i was wondering why why was vernon continuously passing into not double coverage but sometimes triple coverage and it, and yes we do understand that stambic had an issue in game one with catching the balls when it came to the you know a halfback you know a pass to him for a screen we, we understand that uh-huh. but if you look at how good and how when it comes to the history of Alouette's running backs out of the backfield when it comes to catching passes, we've been very, very good. Very yeah, good. I, In one I, game, I, you would think you'd want to go back because they did not even try a screen pass to stand back at all. All game. And they had, he, as I said, it goes down to the choice of what VA made. It's like he lost sight and forgot that he was one of the reads. Yeah, absolutely. I, I again, like as as much as we we applaud of how strong of a running back he is, like how forceful he is, you know, he, like he can get the yards dip going downfield, like trying to plow through everybody. He's got speed too. Like if you were able to put, put him on a hitch and just get, let him, you know, get get the corner, like he, you you know what he can do. You know he can turn the jets on and he can get those. He can turn five yards into eight yeah. very easily. I, I don't understand. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. It, it, it was. Like I said, it's just very bizarre. Some of the the play calling that was that we saw on against Calgary. It yeah. just to me, and then uh, eventually they got it. To, they got it together, and they managed to make yeah. the comeback for the most part, yeah. which is all well and good. But I mean, like it just felt like okay, too little, too late. Yeah, and then obviously the big thing were the penalties once again. Penalties rearing the. It didn't hurt them last week as much as it did this week. Something about the team was just, and it was most, by the way, most of these penalties, and it was 18 called on the Alouettes, 16 were accepted for almost 150 yards. Just, and both you and I, I think both use the same word on social media, is that the team was just so undisciplined. It made, you know, times where they had they had held Calgary to a third down, but a penalty gives them a first down. Um it, it they just shot themselves in the foot over and over and over again last week. Yeah, I mean, I mean the offense wasn't clicking. Defense had a hard time staying disciplined. Uh, offense too would get their fair share of penalties as well. I mean, it was just like I said, everything just that could go wrong went wrong. Mm-hmm. That's really what it came down to, and it's frustrating because yeah, I mean, it really came back to bite the Alouettes on the ass. Like you wouldn't believe it's. Mm-hmm. Like ten penalties against Edmonton. Okay, you know what? You know, you you, you kind of chalked it up. You're like, okay, no preseason games. They're still trying to get their, uh, you know, get their feet wet. You know, you, you can sort of pardon that a little bit. Yeah. But eighteen penalties uh, the next the next game, like that's a regression, and that's not good. Like you nearly yeah. doubled the number of penalties from the week previous. Like that's to me that's ridiculous. Like there's there's no excuse for that as no. far as I'm concerned. No, and the Alouettes. You know, it's funny. The Alouettes were acting as if as if this were. <gasps> Their second preseason game. <laughs> <laughs> well, this really was, I think, their preseason game. Yeah, no, yeah, no like, kidding. No kidding. Uh, um, the other other thing, too, which could be an issue going forward, uh, I mentioned this on social media, two weeks in a row, Cliff, that there have been issues with a long snapper on a field goal attempt. Uh, well, I looked at that again, and, yeah, the first week it definitely was Pierre Lucaro that uh, – just, I guess, trying to find his footing, so to speak. Uh, but that bobbled field goal attempt, uh, I, 
that one, I, I think uh, Joseph Zima has got to own that one. Cause it, and he even showed afterwards, like he was like moving his hands about like trying to explain like why he couldn't plant the football properly. I mean, the snap to me, I think was, I mean, all right, but just his ability to That's keep the, the ball issue, though, there. It's just all. And, and here, here's another question, by the way, uh, to, sorry to interrupt, is that what happened? Now, I understand we're doing punter, punter, uh, you know, holder and kicker, you know, and, and it's, it's staying with the special teams guys. Hmm. Huh? What happened? Because so far through two games, you know, all the special, all the short, short yardage stuff has been done by VA. When are we going? Mm-hmm. Well, let's put Matthew Schultz. Didn't Schultz do it last year? Who did it last year? It was Schultz. Yeah. Why don't we get Schultz out there to do this whole the you know the holding? Try something different. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's to to try and justify having the kicker punter because those are the guys that work together. I mean, it was one thing when Boris Bidet was the uh, the kicker slash punter. Mm-hmm. Like me. He did, he needed someone to hold for him, so that's where right. Schultz would come in. But and but, I guess this year that's their thought is that okay, I know, well, we but don't. To me, Schultz is on the active roster. You're not use wrong. Him. If you're not going to use him on short yardage, use him for something. Yeah, and you know, I'm it's, still back. It's not like you know when Ben came out, you know Ben Cahoon came out, and he was the holder for Damian Duvall, I think, and a few others. Mm-hmm. But something, because to me, it's an issue. You know, we have a new long snapper for the first time in years. And so far, it has cost the Owls two field goals. So we've gotten a grand total of, I think it's one out of six points. I think. I think we made a single on the first one. So it'll be interesting to watch, see what happens this week. Yeah, I mean, like, again, no, nobody expects perfection. But, I mean, like, these are, and these are correctable errors. But, I mean, it, it's still, I, don't know, I guess it's better to do it now than, say, you know, in late November when we're trying to, you know, contend for a playoff spot. Mm-hmm. But. It is, it's concerning, none, nonetheless. So. Oh, I agree. Yeah, no, I completely, completely agree. Um, as far as the the stats go for for the game uh, this past week, they they were up on my screen here a minute ago. Um, <laughs> where did they go? Um, you know, VA. Here it is. VA did a. I mean, again, the stats really really don't say anything. I mean, he was under under fifty percent though, which was. Not VA like, and he was twenty of forty two for two hundred and sixty one yards. That one interception, which I think we can say was our TSN turning point, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Alex Flight Deck turning point. Uh, two two touchdowns. Um, VA also had sixty five yards rushing on eight attempts. Uh, Jeshwin Antwi had one. He had a nice run of ten, and then Stanbeck he had fifteen carries. But I think he had more carries in the first half for a grand total of 82 yards. Now, here comes here come the interesting stats here, Cliff, for the Owls. Uh, uh, Jake Winicky was was the man, the man this week. Um, average 13 and 13.3 yards per catch. Eight catches, 106, 106 yards. He had 12 targets, 12 targets. Eugene Lewis, second leading, 67 yards five, on five receptions. But on 12 targets, <laughs> even B.J. Cunningham, who had 51 yards, he had four receptions, but eight targets. Quan Bray, there was an issue with Quan Bray. I want to ask you about this one. Uh, he had three receptions on eight targets. Now, a lot of the talk during the broadcast also was spe- specifically about Quan. He did make up for it with that touchdown. Um, but, I mean, what... It just goes to what was happening with VA and his the choices that he was making. Or I think on one of the plays in the end zone, I think um, um, Eugene wasn't he he jumped too soon, so he wasn't at the highest point when the ball came down and was and was knocked away. But Quan, I think, had a had a tough game, even though he had more he had more targets than he did last week. He did, uh, and it was noticeable too. Like and again, his reputation precedes him. Like he was one of VA's targets last year, fit preferred targets, right up there with Jake Winnicki. and. Calgary clearly scouted him. They 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 knew that uh, VA likes to look for the little guy, look you know who can get open pretty quick if need be, and they had guys on him. They, I saw double coverage on him uh, quite a few times, and VA was trying to force the ball into his hands uh, clearly, and it just wasn't happening. And it was frustrating because there was a lot of times too, like it would be second and long, and Vernon was trying to connect with Quan, and it just didn't happen. Yeah, like it just it just didn't happen, and. Sure enough, two and out, two and out. And, I mean, it, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, like, yes, Quan did make up for it late in the fourth quarter with a, a very nice little touchdown grab. 
but uh, yeah, it, it was so weird to see, you know, after the, such great chemi- chemistry last season, uh, you know that Vernon's going to try to re- replicate that as much as possible, and it just wasn't happening that last Friday against Calgary. No, no. Defense did pretty well. I mean, we only got one quarterback sack, but we had two picks. Uh, Darius Pickett. Hey, I love that. I love his last name. I, I, I said to you on social, Pickett as a pick. Um, I, I just love his Twitter name, Pick Six Pickett. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and Westside, and, and he nearly lived up to that name too. Oh, I, I, I mean, I mean, at least the pick part. Yeah. So. Yeah, West Sutton had a had a pick too. Um, but I, 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 you know, defense had most of the penalties. Um, there was a little bit of a, a skirmish when it came to. Uh, uh, this is on defense, but, you know, offensive lineman Tony Washington was fine for a chop block. Uh, defensive back Greg Reed was fine for making contact with an official, which you and I don't remember seeing. Not at all. Because I don't think there was a was, – there wasn't a penalty called, as far as I know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was but, like, when? When was it? Uh, you know, the Owls had the ball for 32 minutes, ran 20 more plays than the – it's funny how, how that was – 20 more plays than the than the stamps um but it just it just wasn't to be you know too many variables and again in my opinion it ended with the too short of a pass to gino in the end zone in order for him to be able to get that that ball over the uh, over the goal line hmm. so yeah and i'll be honest with you tim it, it sounds crazy to say but in a way i'm glad the alouettes lost the way they did mm-hmm. and don't get me wrong i never want the alouettes to lose but at the same time, too, I kept thinking back last year or, or last season, I should say. You and I, we, we had talked about this on the pod, is that you said the Alouettes were very inconsistent. Mm-hmm. They win a game, they lose a game. Yeah. They win a game, they lose a game. And it's always by exciting fashion. Don't you know? It's that you know they, they live up to their name, the Cardiac Kids. You know, like they, it was always exci- made for exciting, can't miss football. But I don't want the Alouettes to keep winning like that because they're not that team. They're not that plucky underdog team. I don't think they are. I think they're a very talented team and for them to play the way they did quite frankly it was embarrassing like i I, i'm embarrassed for them and they should be embarrassed with themselves for how they played for pretty much from from the moment that va got picked off by Roy menchi yeah right up to the end yes they they did make the comeback yes it's exciting and of course you're 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 sitting on the the edge of your seat and you're excited but at the same time it shouldn't have had to come to that point no like yellow was they went into edmonton the week before and punched them right in the face they should have done the exact same thing with Calgary. There was no excuses. There was no Bo Levi Mitchell. You had this quarterback wet behind the ears. He never played a down of CFL football. On paper, and I know games are not paid to play on paper, on paper, this should have been another dominant Alois win. Instead, they were chasing their tail for the better part of the game. Uh, they, they just let outside things get in their heads. There was no cohesion whatsoever. And you were forced back into being those cardiac kids. Like, And yes, it is exciting. And it kind of takes two to tango in the sense that Calgary, too, they had their own miscues at the worst possible times, but they did just enough to hold on for the win. Yeah. And Montreal did just enough to make it exciting, but still couldn't seal the deal. It never should have come to that point, as far as I'm concerned. I look at what VA did, and I'm proud of the way he was able to make that comeback. And he put the team on his back like we know he does. But I expect better from him, quite frankly. And I know he expects better from himself. You saw it on social media. Mm-hmm. He said, I know I have to be better. Yep. And I will be better. And I believe him. Yep. I absolutely believe that he is busting his ass all week in practice to not have a repeat performance of that. Yeah. To me, like that's the one I thing will... I, I, that's the one thing I will say about this team is that yes, they are capable, but it never should have come to that point. There never should have been an instance where these guys had to fight the way they did in order to compete in this game to maybe win and yeah. end up coming up short. I agree. So uh, hopefully they'll they'll take it and say well before we finish up the segment and we can. And we get to our interview with uh, with Matthew Pru. Um, yeah, it's it's a matter of getting better. You and I pointed out quite a bit of stuff. I mean, this week it's it is it may be the it may be the it may be the zero and two Hamilton Tiger Cats coming into town. It may be the zero and two Hamilton Tiger Cats coming in uh, with uh, you know, with Jeremiah Mazzoli on the on the sideline and some other players because of their other issues. Still, it's the Hamilton Tiger Cats that are coming to town, and which we'll talk about. After we, uh, after we, t- after our interview, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it- it's a lot. Hopefully, as I said, they learn from it. They got the preseason game out of them. Let's continue. I will take 
a 2-1 record for over three games for the entire season, Cliff, because if that's the case, then we get to 10 wins. Mm-hmm. So. And also, too, I, I remember seeing a lot of CFL pundits looking at the Alouettes' first three games and assuming they were going to 0-3 because Edmonton was supposed to be this big, powerful team. Calgary was supposed to be Calgary as they're supposed to be. Hamilton, the, the class of the East and the defending, you know, Grey Cup participants. Yeah. I mean, like these should have been, you know, really tough games for the Alouettes. Mm-hmm. And that was not the case. I mean, like these were so far two very winnable games. And we'll see what happens on this Friday against Hamilton. But, uh, I mean, things are not looking good for Hamilton right now. So, I mean, like this is a prime opportunity. If Montreal can go into this or come out of this, I should say, with a 2-1 and record, that is very impressive. Yeah, but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. So, right now, we we'll, and, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we finish. So, uh, uh, again, as, as I said, uh, once we finish our speaking with, uh, with Matthew, uh, we'll come back, talk about... Uh, a couple of things that the Alouettes have, have uh, announced for this season. Uh, they've all actually announced um, uh, different, uh, I, I don't want to say theme nights. I guess we can call them theme nights in a way uh, and what they're going to be having. So very interesting. And uh, as I said, uh, we'll do that once we get back. Uh, with us this week is a, a gentleman you should know very well. Um, he is, is an integral part of the 1997 Grey Cup champ. Excuse me, the 97th Grey Cup champions. Uh, talk to him about his career with the Owls and what he's done after the fact. Uh, online with us now, Matthew Prue. Hey, Matthew, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure, guys. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Uh, good. Um, good. By the good. way, how, right. how, how can you not be excited? There's a football game live this week. Yes. Yeah, there are there there f- live football games for the past few weeks. So yeah, we can't really complain after the past year we just went through. So yeah, pretty exciting. Pretty exciting. Uh, it's hard to believe. I mean, can, can, would you ever have thought that we would be able to see our first Alouettes game at Percival Molson for the first time in 656 days? That's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, it's completely nuts, honestly. At some point, even through all this pandemic and the canceled season, at some point, we even wondered if we'd see football and pro football again in Montreal for a number of years. And it's just a blessing to have the yeah. ability to see these guys again, mm-hmm. and have a season, albeit a shorter season than usual, 14 games. I'll take it. Four games against Ottawa. That's fine. I don't care. Whatever. Just give me a season. We have games. We have live football, and I'm pretty excited to go to Percival Molson um, Friday night. I agree. I completely agree. Um, for those who don't know about, about a little, you just know a little bit about your career. Um, I know you're born in Plaster Rock, New Brunswick, and I know I know where Plaster Rock is because I have I have some in laws who used to live in Plaster Rock. It's a it's a little, really? little itty bitty tiny town. I think they're known for their fiddle, their fiddleheads, if I'm not mistaken. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, when did you uh, when did you locate to uh, to Gatineau, Matthew? At what age? Well, yeah, this it, long story short, my yeah. dad's in the RCMP, so his first job ah. was in Plaster Rock. That's why I was born there. I lived there for only a few months and okay. then moved around a bit, went to Capelé, Caraquette, Moncton, so all over New Brunswick and ended up in Gatineau uh, when I was about 12 or 13 years old. So just at uh, the end of elementary school and okay. uh, started my second at my high school there in, in Gatineau. Okay, okay. What now? Uh, you Obviously, you went to what is now, you know, obviously the powerhouse in Laval. Uh, for the Rouge mm-hmm. for the Rouge AR. what what got you into football initially, though? Well, you know what, fall was the kind of a down period for me. I was a guy who played multiple sports. I did everything, but I never played football because there wasn't football in my high school or even in my city. So, um, so I it was like a down period for for every sport because it's like cold and, and rainy and, and one of my friends when I was 18 years old proposed to me he's like why, why don't you try on football and I said okay why not I never tried it before uh, so I went to one practice and that was it I had one practice I was hooked fell in love with the sport never looked back um, started playing midget in the uh, Ottawa region mm-hmm. so I had to uh, cross the border to play in Ontario play there for a season um, was, uh, recruited by different sea jets because I played Okay, my, my first year midget went to André Grasset, uh, CJET level, that, where one of my friends actually played, um, and then got recruited at Laval, and at that time, it was the only uh, French um, program. Uh, there wasn't no Carabin, no Varial, mm-hmm. uh, University of Sherbrooke, and I wanted to study law, so Laval had a good law program, a great football program, and it was just uh, too good of an opportunity to miss out, so I Leaded me there, and I went in as a raw athlete and came out as a football player yeah. um, a few years after. So it was, it was a great time. 
at Laval, and I really um, one of the best choices I've ever made in my life was to go to Laval University. Was uh, at the time I can't remember were the Phoenix uh, of Andre Grasset were they a powerhouse in Sage Ball? Because I know it's Sage Ball has changed so much with the different we, levels so and stuff now. Yeah. Because I remember no, we, there was actually only two divisions at the time. Now I think there's three or even four. Yeah. Um, it was like triple A and double A. Now it's division one, division yeah. two, and three and stuff like that. So we uh, a few years back, I think two years before I got there, they got relegated to double A, which was division two, and we were one of the good teams in division two. Went to the semifinal the year I was there. Okay. Um, and they they had a few bad seasons after that, and then all of a sudden around the end of the two thousands. Um, they started being strong again. Uh, the Yadaluka guys went and went in there and um, brought in a few good coaches, some great players, and eventually became a powerhouse. And now it's the powerhouse in Division One uh, CJ football. Yeah, they are, they are, they were able to go up against the the powerhouses of uh, of uh, Saint Jean Saint Laurent yeah, and, and Ben Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there oh, you oh go. yeah, but, yeah, we're right. Yeah, and Montreal too. You're right. Forgot about them. <laughs> can't, I can't forget about them. So. Um, <laughs> What was it like in the early days for for Laval? Because you know everybody now knows what Laval. They want their co- their college ball to be like Laval because yeah, college ball, university ball in Quebec is so unique because of how with the boosters and and I mean booster clubs. I think as far as I know, in other parts of Quebec, uh, other parts of Canada are few and far between. But mm-hmm. what what was it like playing uh, at University of Laval? Well, it, 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 first off, it was awesome because the guys I played with were, were just great guys and, and I had great coaches um, and the city embraced the team. So it was like a, a professional team in a bigger market mm-hmm. because when you look at Quebec City, they don't have any, um, well, when the Nordiques left, basically they didn't have any major league sports there. So they have the hop off and the QHL uh, and they have like 10,000 people a game. They had they had us the Rougeau and they had the Capital at baseball. Right. So they have a few teams that they really support. They really rally around. Uh, Laval is a huge university as well. I think it's like thirty five or forty thousand students. So just the student body is pretty huge. Um, so playing my first game there, coming from the CJ level and going there and having like eighteen twenty thousand people in the stands, all geared up in Nike. Uh, it's pretty. It's a pretty awesome feeling. And my first year there was uh, Glenn Constantine's first year as a head coach. Yeah. Um, so it was. Uh, it, it was pretty exciting to, to see that kind of the, the the rise of that program. Two years prior to that, they won their first Vanier. The year before, they were they had a perfect record in the regular season. So it was just it, it, you could see, you could feel that something was bubbling there. That something was big, and, and and we can build it to be something that it is. That something that we see today, which is the reference and the standard for for excellence in, mm-hmm. in university football. Um, I just really attribute that to, to a lot of factors. I would say, obviously, having the city support the team, having uh, Mr. Tagi, who was there, who was injecting money and, and, and I mean sparing no expense to make sure the team is well treated and well prepared for each season, uh, making it the most professional atmosphere possible. And then you have to talk about the coaches. I yeah. mean, the coaching staff there is just awesome. It's the same coaching staff for the past 20 years. So uh, there's no, it's, it's, it's no um, coincidence that this team is, is good year in and year mm-hmm. out. These guys know each other very well. Uh, they're excellent coaches. All these guys had opportunities to coach at the pro level, but they all feel good and are well treated there and like the program. They, they, they love the red and gold. So, I mean, um, it's just a, a multiple factors that make, this is the experience of Laval is so incredible and makes what they are today, which is a powerhouse. And I'm just so proud to be, uh, be uh, to have been part of that program for four years and to be able to uh, to win two venue cups. I can only imagine. I mean, it's you know Laval really has become the team, not not only to to you know to uh, that you want to mirror yourself after, but they've also become the team to hate. You know, you're like the Dallas Cowboys <laughs> or the New York Yankees. <laughs> Of, uh, of it's use, always good uh, when people hate it's because you're doing something right exactly so, uh, exactly yeah, yeah. exactly uh, they, leave, they, they, they leave no they, one indifferent yeah. yeah what do they say they hate us because they ain't us <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> now Sounds about right what is what is interesting is after your career in laval you were picked up in the you know in the 2005 uh, cfl draft into the first round pick number five um what did you have any inkling of where you were going to go or had you been t- contacted by other teams, or because a lot of a lot of players, 
and a lot of fans, sorry, a lot of fans really may not know the the ins and outs of the Canadian draft versus the mm-hmm. U.S. draft that we see on TV every year. But did you know you were going to Montreal, or is it possible you actually may have gone to another team? I had no clue I was going to Montreal. No, um, no it, it wasn't. It, there's more coverage now than there was back in the days. I do think teams do more due diligence. Uh, do um, how do you say this? The uh, due diligence yes. on their uh, on, on their future draft picks. Uh, back in the days, there wasn't so many like interviews or or sit downs. Now teams really have like a period of sit downs, so they meet like twenty, thirty, forty candidates. We didn't have that back in the days. Um, so, so, and I never talked to anyone in Montreal either. So, right, which is kind of risky if you ask my if you if, if you ask my opinion because um, you don't know if some some people drafted guys who didn't want to play football anymore. Some teams drafted guys who wanted to pursue their studies who um, didn't want to move from home. Or, so, so nowadays teams really invest more time and energy in, in making sure that the draft picks they have are going right. to be long term projects for their programs. Uh, but no, the morning of the draft, I remember it as, as if it was yesterday. It was April 28th, 2005. In the morning of the draft, Mike Benavides, the now defensive coordinator for Ottawa, was the defensive coordinator for the Lions, uh, the BC Lions, uh, called me on the phone and I sp- spoke to him for like an hour the morning of the draft. And he has, asked me questions about what do I want to do in life? What did I study? Do I have a girlfriend? Do I want to move? If BC drafted me, uh, would I be willing to go and spend a number of years there and whatever? So basically, they told me they wanted to make me their first round draft pick. Yeah. So I was, I was sure, guaranteed sure that I was going to BC and move into Vancouver. Uh, I think Vancouver had the seventh overall pick. And Montreal didn't have a top 10 pick and, and they traded their kicker at the time, who was Matt Kellett, for Ottawa's draft pick. And they moved up to number five and drafted me. So I was pretty surprised and pretty excited. Um, and I finished my bachelor's degree the same day. So wow. uh, April 28th, 2005, Matt Prue partied like it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, like it was something else. Like well, it, was it was 2005. Was a great, great day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> so basically, you go from one team that people love to hate to another team that people love to hate at that time. So. <laughs> Yeah, you you, you were doing, you did pretty well, I would imagine. It's uh, what so you were talking about before, you know, starting off as a young guy going into football for the very first time, then going into U Laval. What was it like being a rookie in the CFO with the Alouettes? Yeah, I, I took things a bit lightly when I went to the Rougiard. I didn't know what to expect, and I had never trained before. I wasn't really prepared for that step, but I was prepared for this one. I was really trained hard, and I had my coaches in Laval prepare me as best they can for my start in the pros. So. Um, and being drafted in the first round in, in, in any sport, in, in football, I think mainly, you know you're going to make the team. Yeah. Like, I didn't really know that at the time, but some veteran players told me and, and kind of explained more of what I thought was, I don't know, I had to, to earn my spot. And I did have to earn my spot, but basically if the team's drafting you in the first round, they're going to give you at least a year to, to prove yourself. So uh, I went there nervous, but I went there really prepared. Um, and I was pretty lucky because I went to Grasset and at Grasset, the CGIP level, we had a winning team. Yeah. I went to Laval, we had winning teams my four seasons there. And I came to Montreal, which was one of the best teams in the CFL. And I had a winning team for the six seasons I was here. So um, so I was pretty lucky to, to join a team with that same kind of aura around them. Uh, but I was supported by veteran players like Eric Lapointe, Sylvain Giral, and there's like obviously this French connection that there is in the CFL and guys take care of each other. So I had these guys take me under their wings and uh, take care of me uh, through my first steps. And and I was, I was prepared and I was supported through that process. So I was, I was ready to go year one. Um, And I think uh, I proved that I was, that I belonged in the CFL and it was, it was a pretty exciting time uh, to start my career with the Owls with all the, obviously the, um, the notoriety that goes with it, the recognition, um, being a, a pro sport, it's, it's another level of, of, of uh, competition, which is pretty exciting. So it was it was a great time, 2005, 2006. Those first seasons were pretty exciting in Montreal. Yep. And then obviously in 05, you, your peers agreed with you. You were, you were, you know, you were, you were voted to most outstanding rookie. Uh, what, what was it like uh, when you were when your name was uh, announced as the as the winner? Yeah, I don't really want to downplay what I won, but I, I it wasn't that great a year in, in my opinion. I played great on special teams mm-hmm. and I had a few good games and stuff. I, I did play well, but um, I just think to, to be very honest and transparent, I don't think the competition at the rookie level was that high in the Eastern Division. 
and I was pretty lucky to have that title, which which I was proud of, but I was I think I was lucky and uh so so yeah, it's just exciting. Whatever recognition and personal recognition you have in your career, it's always fun and it's right. flattering, but uh it, this sounds really cliche, but I'm all about winning on with my team and I'm all about championships. Oh, like I'm that. not about like um individual honors which is fun uh it's flattering but honestly like most of the players and they'll say it and it sounds cliche but it's true it, it, you, you play a team sport to win team uh honors you don't do it to win individual honors so so yeah so it was good but i don't put too much on that it's funny matthew how many people and players at cliff and i have spoken with over the years you guys are so humble so humble. Yeah, right. oh, I'll take that as a compliment. It is. It, it, it is. It, it, it is. It's an honest compliment because sometimes, sometimes you know, fans will only see what they see on television or the persona that a, a player will put on themselves while they are playing mm-hmm. during the career. They don't know the real person. I, I love being able. You know, that's just that's what it is. It's all about the team, and it's it's really really great to hear. So, um, Cliff, yeah, well, fo- football's a humbling sport too, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, because you're gonna hit your wall once in a while. You're gonna have your tough moments. So if you think you're all that, uh, he's gonna bring you down back to earth pretty pretty quickly. So it's it's a humbling uh, sport. It's a it's a humbling experience at, at many times. Mm-hmm. So I think, um, and, and just football's a, to me the ultimate team sport. Yeah, uh, and and I think if you get to play as, as long as I was lucky to play, you realize throughout your career that it's not about you, it's about the people around you. So, um, yeah, so I think the good, the, the good football players realize that in their career, uh, and that's something definitely that I, I learned through mine. Cool. Cliff. All right, let's talk about these championships because, let's face it, you're, the first four years of your career, you were sur- all, three of the four years you were surrounded by the Grey Cup. Uh, going into the mm-hmm. Grey Cup in 2005, 2006, and 2008. Coming up short each time, did you think it was going to be easy to get to the Grey Cup? Or do you think it was just a matter of, I'm good enough to get to the Grey Cup, now what do I have to do to win the Grey Cup? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's tough, obviously. My, well, I kind of maybe took it for granted my first year because I was just trying to make my own way and trying to kind of figure out the ropes on my just for my own sake. Um, and we lost that, that great cup in double overtime against Edmonton in Vancouver, uh, against Danny Machocha, Ricky Ray was the quarterback. Uh, and I played the whole second half and the overtime because uh, Richard Carey Carey at the time was injured himself. So he couldn't play the second half. So as a rookie, I played the second half and, and overtime at, at starting safety for, for the team, which was pretty nerve wracking. So I was just kind of concentrating on, on my own stuff. So when we lost that great cup, I was like, okay, we'll, we'll have many more chances. But I didn't think it would be that hard to go back. Fortunately, we did go back uh, on, on many occasions, but every time we lost. And, and I'm going to say the first two years we lost was 2005 we lost. I was like, okay, this is my rookie year. We're good. We'll go back. 2006 we played against BC in Winnipeg, the great cup. And BC was just that much stronger than us. 2007 we didn't go. In 2008 we went again. And this time we felt really great. It's Mark Tresson's first year, and we go to the Great Cup, and we lost that one at the Big O in front of 66,000 people. That's the most heartbreaking loss I've ever had in my career. And that, at that point, I really felt like, okay, shit, are we going to lose this thing year in and year out? Am I eventually going to win one? Or is this, like, Dan, was this as the closest we came to a championship? So it was really tough the first few years, but... Uh, as you know, the, the rest of the story, we kind of figured it out in 2009, but uh, we came so close so many times that, uh, that we kind of were on us. Uh, I think the core players there for, for a number of years, it was kind of tough to, to live through. But, I mean, that's football, right? Uh, you win some, you lose some. Unfortunately, we lost more cups than we won. So um, that's just part of the game. Now, talking about those, when you finally do get that championship, I mean, you were a back-to-back champion with Laval, and then you end up becoming a back-to-back champion with the Alouettes. Uh, would you say one is sweeter than the other, or are they just special in their own ways? No, they're special in their own ways. I would say the first ones are pretty um, pretty memorable. So my first Vanny Cup, my first Grey Cup are pretty memorable just because they're the first and you've never had it before. So experiencing it for the first time is pretty awesome. Um, unfortunately, the 2009 Grey Cup I didn't play because I was injured, but uh, I really felt like I was part of that team too. So finishing my career at Laval with two Vanny Cups, finishing my um, my career with the, uh, with the Owls with two Grey Cups is pretty sweet. I mean... A lot of people obviously want to go up on top, go out on top, and, and can't really choose that, or you don't really have the opportunity to do it. 
I did have that opportunity, so I'm pretty excited to say I left as a champion at both places, and uh, that's yeah, it's pretty cool to say that that I went back to back twice. It's definitely I I'm struggling to think of someone else who may have come close to hitting that remark, and I can't think of anyone. <laughs> so it's <laughs> I, I'd, I'd say yeah, you're in pretty good company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty good uh, select group. So you got to go to Laval and figure out if you guys from Laval probably are the only team that. University of football to win back to back a few times in the past 20 years, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's a real blessing. Which I have to ask before Cliff continues. Which which of the four rings do you cherish the most? Um, I would say my my Alouette's first one, the 2009 Grey Cup that we won, the, the famous 13th men. Mm-hmm. Um, that one is is pretty special because it was my fourth time at the Grey Cup, my fourth participation in the Grey Cup in five years. Uh, I really felt like I was part of that uh, core group of players. I was in starting safety. Um, I had a big role, not only on the field, but off the field as well, in the locker room as a leader and stuff. So it was, that was a pretty exciting time. In 2009, just for myself, was a pretty good, big year. I, had, I passed the bar exam, so I became a lawyer in 2009. I got married in 2009, and I won a great cup in 2009. So that was a pretty sweet year uh, that I'll remember and cherish for, for, uh, for as long as I live. So, so you got like two rings that year. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'll tell you one that's worth a lot more than the other one. But I won't say which one. <laughs> Especially if your wife's listening to you talk. So you better, there you go. You better answer there you carefully. Go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, uh, the 2010 Grey Cup, your second one, uh, yep. I remember you and Etienne Boulet uh, kind of uh, having a little chat with the media talking about the supposed treatment that the Alouettes were getting compared to the Rough Riders. Uh, yeah. Take us through some of that because I remember it causing a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of controversy with uh, some of the remarks that you guys had made. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, it's the the hotel gate. Um, basically, when we got to to uh, to the hotel in Edmonton, uh, we were in the I don't remember the name of the hotel. It's probably a good thing I don't remember. Ch- chateau something, but it was the furthest thing from a chateau that I've ever seen. But anyway, so, but and it was like a cylinder. So the hotel is a cylinder. So you got to imagine this. So we're meeting. Uh, and the, the meeting rooms are like kind of curved, right? Because the hotel is a cylinder, the, the shape of the, uh, of the silo. So you're, if the coach is in front of the meeting and trying to talk to everyone, well, the guys who sit in the back can't even see the screen because the room's curved. So it, it didn't make any sense. Um, we didn't have like anything to print or, or all our scouting reports and stuff. We didn't have printers. Uh, we didn't have a training room. We didn't have a room like because when you practice after practice, you go in the cold tubs and the hot tubs and stuff. We didn't have that in the hotel. We didn't have anything. And the riders were in the super nice hotel, the team hotel, the, the league hotel. And um, and our coaches, it didn't really come from me, honestly. I I, but I I bit the bullet because I was injured and I could deal with it. But um, our coaches and our GM, Jim at the time, and Mark Tresman were, were livid and they were pissed and they told us and. It was like, well, you know what? They're disrespecting us, and we're going to do this. They might have used it as a motivational tool. I don't know, but but it was true though. Like, and I was insane. The only thing I regret through that time uh, is saying that the league wanted the Rough Riders to win more. Like, I can't give them any intentions. That might not be true. It might be true. I don't know, but I can't say if it is or not. What I know is that we were put in a, a disadvantageous position compared to another team you expect that when you go to a great cup or a championship game that both both teams are treated equally and have the same amount of services leading up to the game in order to prepare it the best as they can and we didn't feel we had that so there was a lunch and dinner with the media and i I kind of mounted off about that and and all the other because you know how it is in championship week there's so many media there and they're looking for stories and they're looking for a soundbite and they're looking to to say something in, in a different angle or a different story. So when, uh, so when someone like me comes out and starts criticizing the league for the, the treatment they're giving us, well, all of the media through Canada jumped on the story. So, um, so that was pretty intimidating because then I started getting calls and emails and stuff, and and it was there was a practice and I wasn't playing because I was injured, so I was on crutches. So I'm gonna this story's gonna end soon. Don't worry. Uh, and so. <laughs> So the coach comes up to me. He's like, "Okay, media wants to talk to you. Look, you, you can. We're going to back you on whatever you say. We, we have confidence in you. You're a smart guy. So go defend our position, but don't include any other player or coach. Don't talk about anyone else. Just talk about yourself and what you feel this is. But don't include anyone else because we don't this we don't want this to be a distraction for the other players. So basically, they were throwing me in the lion's den to answer the questions 
And, um, and so I come outside and I'm on my crutches and all of a sudden I think like two or three media are going to come out, but there's like a scrum, like 50 people surrounding me and just bombarding me with questions. Uh, and they were pretty aggressive too. So, and I remember this for, uh, forever, the, the next day, the, the headline in the, in the newspaper in Regina was, how do you spell princess in French? P-R-O-U-L-X. And I thought that was just brilliant. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so it was tough for me, but it was especially tough for Etienne because he was playing and he, it really, uh, hit him. Like he was really distracted and he thought it was really tough. Um, but again, I think it served as motivation for a team and ultimately we won. So it wasn't too bad, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was something else to, to go through that uh, media storm that I did in 2010. <laughs> And it's so ironic that you end up as a member of the media now, as you know, yeah. I'm not saying as a result of this, but at least now you sort of understand where the other side of the coin is. So it's yeah, uh, for sure. For it, sure. it definitely makes it for a very fascinating case study, if nothing else. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, it was my crash course in media, and it was pretty aggressive, but it was pretty good. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the, you passed with flying colors because there you know, you it's go. one. So <laughs> there you go. And I have a job in the media, so I'm, a, I'm all good. And that's it. That's all anybody remembers is uh, exactly. you know, the end result. Everybody remembers the winners. So, exactly. <laughs> uh, when when you look back at those those championship years in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, uh, what were some of the biggest memories that you have besides winning the Grey Cups? Like, what what was it about that team that was so special? I think it's just the fact that we were the same core group of players that went to every Grey Cup before. Like, it was the same group of guys that went, or almost the two thousand five, two thousand six. Uh, Mark Trisman came in and brought obviously new guys in 2008, which was the start of something special. And we knew as soon as Mark came in and he brought his, his staff and, and a few new players that we had something special. And just riding the Anthony Calvillo wave and the Ben Cahoon wave and, and all these guys who had legendary careers and Hall of Fame careers that you could line up again next to and, and feel like you were a Hall of Fame yourself. Um, lining up to guys next to guys like that just makes you feel that much stronger. And, and I, it's another cliche, but what you really remember, what you really miss when you leave sports is the camaraderie. You miss the locker room. I don't miss running down on kickoff and hitting a guy with, with 40 yard sprint. I don't, I really don't miss that, but I do miss shooting the shit with the guys in the morning and having coffee with them before the meeting and just joking around and having fun and, and just realizing that I'm paid to play whatever it is. I'm paid to play. Like that was my job. I, I, I who said this? There was a media guy who said this. I can't remember. He said, it's a job I, I get to do. Not that I got to do, that I get to do. And that's really how I felt every time I showed up there. I was so lucky to just put a, pants, uh, put a pair of jogging pants on and go play ball with my friends. And, uh, so I miss those guys. Uh, and that's really what I remember is, is how that group was united, how that group was strong, how our leadership was strong. Uh, and that's really what I miss as well. All right. Now, going into your, your post-football career, uh, you end up uh, taking law in uh, the University of Laval. And one thing I can't help but notice is there's a lot of lawyers on the Montreal Alouettes, past, present, <laughs> and even future, too. Uh, it started with Jacques Climie, or Jacques Climie. Yeah. Uh, you got yourself, uh, Marco Broyette, and uh, now even uh, Chris Osekusi is going after his law degree. What is it about the Alouettes go. and lawyers? What? Can you explain that? <laughs> no clue. I have no clue. But it is interesting to see, though, because I don't remember seeing too many lawyers in other teams. So I don't know. There's, there might be something. A few good law programs in Montreal. I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah. Uh, and a few good good ones in there, too. I know Jock is a, a pretty good uh, lawyer. I know Marco is doing his thing, too. So, yeah, I didn't get to practice law that much because I stopped to, to jump in the media. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's something there for sure. you got to investigate. You think maybe we could see an Alouette's law firm one of these days? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. There might be a few clients on the team as well. So there you go. You could be okay with uh, with a few guys on the team. Oh, uh, there you go. Once we get to a certain point, I can only see it now. It's the the, the, the Montreal starting nine or the starting defense or offense. We're, we're going to start getting enough players that are, are lawyers. that Nobody's going to want to play them for fear of being sued. <laughs> <laughs> or it's going to cost it's going to be very expensive to have them all on the field at the same time because their hourly rate is going to be more expensive than CFL players that's true billable hours that's right <laughs> billable hours there you're you right go. you're right <laughs> um 
Cliff just brought it up now. We want what what made you do the transition over to television? Because you know, you know, Jacques Clemy as an example, I, I think he did television first before full before being a lawyer full time. And but it just how did you end up getting the itch to be in television? I had opportunity, I guess. Um, I, we we kind of kid or joked around before, but but the fact that I was constantly interviewed day in and day out. Um, at practice as, as a member of the, the French guys, right. uh, the French mafia or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I was always like a spokesperson or unofficial spokesperson for the team. And I was always uh, doing clips for the media. So it's kind of a, um, kind of a training camp for media there for, for yeah. a number of years. I was constantly interviewed. So I kind of made my way through that and, and learned to be comfortable doing it. Uh, and at the same time, I practiced law, which is basically being able to analyze the situation, um, uh, kind of build your argumentation towards proving your point. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing in television too, right? So mm-hmm. there, there, is, there are similarities in both. Uh, I'm, I am someone who's pretty comfortable uh, speaking to a public forum. Um, my French is better than my English, but uh, I think the fact that I'm bilingual too helps me uh, interview, uh, doing the, do the interviews and stuff. Um, so yeah, so I think all of that combined together and the opportunity that RDS gave me, um, I had one opportunity to do it. And when I finished a, a, diff- a few different broadcasters approached me and kind of wondered if I would do it or not. And I, I told myself, okay, I'm going to try it for a few years and keep my, my license. And if I don't like this, then I just go back to law and, and try that out. So, um, I tried it out for a year and I've been doing it for 11 years now. Never look back. Uh, I don't have my law practice anymore. I don't have my, my license to practice. Um, put that aside, and I'm full-time media now. I've been doing it for 11 years, and if I can do it for another 22 years, I'd uh, I'd be super happy to be able to do that uh, for, for, for my whole career, my post-career playing football. Wow. wow. And uh, have you ever thought about uh, doing any other sports for RDS, or is it just strictly football? Yeah, I know, but I started doing a show which is called Daniel Tongue, which is a hockey show. Uh, we started doing that two years ago, which is like kind of a – coach's room um so basically i host that show because i went from being an analyst i'm still an analyst to being a host so i when you're a host you don't need to know all the ins and outs or all the the different like um all the details of the sport you're covering you need to be able to put people in a good uh position to explain their points and, and to look good basically you make the analyst shine so that's my role now uh, so they thought I was doing a good job on football and they invited me to do it on a hockey show. So for the past two years now, I do that on RDS 2. So when the game is on, the hockey game with the uh, Canadians is on, on RDS, we do it on RDS 2. So I'm like on a kind of a, uh, I'm on a couch, like in a living room with a few ex-hockey players and a few coaches. And we just talk about the game without doing pure play-by-play. We just talk about what we're seeing, the strategies that are being employed. Um, guys talk about different players, anecdotes of what they've, they saw uh, in the game or, or what they lived in the past. Um, so it's pretty exciting to, to be able to do more than football. Uh, I, that's my first love and I want to stay to it. But, uh, but if I get opportunities to do stuff like that around different sports, uh, RDS is pretty good with me and giving me the opportunity to do that. And uh, if I get other projects like that, I'd be more than happy to, to jump on board. So you, you kind of do, for those who may not, you know, who are listening in the U S and don't know, don't, you know, don't watch RDS and all that. So you kind of do what they do on ESPN, like during some of the major bowl games. And yeah. okay, you're like a second. That's exactly it. Yeah, you're like a second second station where they have the game, but you're all as I said you're you're commenting about the game live in real time. That's what that's where the idea came from. The the, the I think the first time they did that in the states was for like the national championship. Yeah. Um, and it really it works really well because it's a it's a completely different way to watch the game, and especially during the pandemic, people were all by themselves at home. Mm-hmm. And it kind of felt like for people watching our show, like they were sitting in the living room with us and just shooting the shit and just talking and having fun. So that's basically what we're trying to offer the clientele or our so our viewership is something a different way to watch the game and a different way to describe the game. So yeah, so that's exactly what it is. It's coach's room. Uh, with people who've been there and done it before, and I'm just there to make sure that everyone gets time to talk and 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 gets time to shine and and get their point across. So so yeah, it's it's very very fun to yeah. do. Um, we did it a few times during football, and it's it's great to do. I think for a lot of sports, um, but it's super fun to do for hockey. I can imagine. Um, I I had to ask, being at RDS for as long as you have, 
what is the weirdest thing you've ever been asked to cover? <laughs> uh, I haven't asked, been asked to cover anything weird. Like, uh, no, never. Yeah. I, I'm trying to remember. No, nothing weird. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm lucky. <laughs> like, but... like Tony Manziel's <laughs> first game, maybe? <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's a great point, Cliff. That's a great one. That that saga and that whole thing is so ridiculous. I would say that's probably you know what that circus and the fact that we had to talk about him all the time because yeah. even like small town like the the new hits that we had to do uh, they always wanted to have a Manzel angle because he would, I mean he sells and people want to know and people are curious. So yeah, so that saga was pretty I and mean, all the Cavis Reed era was pretty weird to cover, but. Outside of football, not anything particular. In football, a lot of weird things that happened throughout the, the past decade that I was there. I can only imagine. <laughs> so let's talk about the Alouettes now. I mean, yeah. 2019 season was absolutely incredible for the Alouettes. Like, it really revitalized football here in Montreal, uh, got people excited about the Alouettes again. Uh, 2020, everybody had to take a break from it, unfortunately. Now, 2021, we're in a new regime. We've got uh, new ownership, new GM, new president, a whole new look for the team. What are your thoughts on what you've seen so far from the Montreal Alouettes, and what are you expecting going forward as the season progresses? Yeah, well, I guess the people who are listening to us before the, the Friday night game against Hamilton will have the same assessment as I have. It, it, it was I saw two teams this year. So I saw one great team that played in Edmonton. I saw a team that was fired up. Uh, I saw an offense that was ready to hit the home run like they did a few times. I saw a quarterback that was driven, that was precise, that was good. I saw a defense that improved as the game went on. And then I saw the Calgary game where adversity hit and the team just crumbled. Um, and, and it's not even being hard. I think if they watch the tape and they're not honest with themselves, they really crumbled through adversity. We all thought it would be a walk in the park. Uh, you go against the rookie quarterback with two rookie tackles. Uh, Sean Lemon on the defense is in there, so their best defensive end is in there. Their second defensive end, Ori Mulade, is hurt during the game. They lose a defensive tackle. I mean, there was nothing there for Calgary to win. And they came and they just shook Montreal. As soon as VA threw that pick when, it's 14, when it was 14-3, to that was the first moment of adversity. And you saw the team really react badly to that. They, they crumbled. And it was, it was kind of hard to watch. It was frustrating. Um, I think Harry Jones said embarrassing. It was all and that. It was tough. Uh, the penalties were way too much. Um, and they did still have an opportunity to win the game, which is, which is kind of encouraging. Uh, it's game two of the season. I'm not going to panic. Uh, I hope no one in the building's panicking either. I think they have tremendous talent. Um, I think it's a team that it will improve on defense. I think Baron Miles will improve as a defensive corner and, and a single caller. Um, but I do think they have all the elements to succeed. And it's not just this game that I'm going to judge the Alouettes on. I think they have a, a good core group of guys, and I do think they have a good team to play this year. Now, do you think this is a team that could contend for the Grey Cup easily, or do you think that it's going to still come down to Hamilton at the end of the season? No, I really do think Montreal's in the thick of things. I really do think they have the roster, they have the coaches, they have everything they need to win a Grey Cup this year. And it's a nine-team league, and when you're – when you got it, when you have a good quarterback, when you have a good core group of Canadian guys, and when you have a defense that can pressure the quarterback, normally you can win in the CFL. And they have all these elements. Now, Vernon Adams can't get hurt because, in my opinion, and with all due respect to Matt Schultz, they don't have much behind Vernon Adams. It would be very, very difficult for the Al to produce offensively, and if he gets hurt, uh, this offensive line has to gel. Uh, and when I say gel, I'm not just gel on the field, but gel off the field in meetings. Uh, there was a little scrap at, at practice between uh, Schlugger and Tony Washington at practice two weeks ago, and they're going to say it's all good and, and everything's fine, but that's kind of weird. I never saw that before. Uh, you can see defensive line and offensive line getting at it and fighting in practice. I don't, I've never seen two offensive line uh, players fight together, so that's kind of something I, I hope they figure out and, and they, they kind of gel and mesh together. I know Luc Valajaldain is a tremendous coach. Uh, he's going to have that group prepared. And then on the defensive side of the ball, you got to make sure you have um, guys who are going to earn their, their their playing time, take their reps. We saw Wesley Sutton have a, a tough game last week. Well, you know what? Maybe sit him and play another guy and try something else this time, um, and and give time and give time for guys to to acclimate to acclim how do you say that? But get used to the CFL. Yep. Acclimate. 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 Uh, That's right. Acclimate. Yeah. 
So, um, no, I really do think they're contenders. I, I really, really do feel that Montreal is a team that's going to be very tough every week. Um, but they just need to improve and learn from this mistake. And you know what? Every championship team I was on before, Laval or, or, or Montreal, there was always one or two defeats during the season that were wake-up calls and that were great lessons for the, for the rest of the season. So hopefully they do just take this game against Calgary and use it as a learning tool and, and improve on it. What are your uh, what are your thoughts um, on the Alouettes kicking game? You know, this is something that the Alouettes have not done since 1986, having literally two guys, you know, one for punting and, and the other one for place kicking. What what are your thoughts on that? Because obviously, when you were with the Alouettes all those years, it was just one guy who was doing everything. You think it's yeah. a, that can help, or or do you think that will hinder the Alouettes going forward this season? No, I do think that's something that can help. Um, I've I've always. Um, I, I, you know what? It depends on your kickers. It depends on your personnel. If you can have one that can do everything, great. If you don't, then then go for two kickers instead of high. If, if you really, and, and that's the thing. I think you uh, you go with the personnel you have. So if you do have a kicker who can do it, great. That's the best scenario because you save up a roster spot for someone else. But if you don't have that kicker who can do all three phases, then I wouldn't be shy of undressing a, a team's player or a backup to put two kickers in there. The kicking game is so important in the CFL. You know it. Yeah. I mean, it's three down football. Uh, there's a lot of punting. There's a lot of field goals. Um, so you really, really need to have a solid kicking game if you want to win, uh, if you want to win games and ultimately the great cup. So I really feel this is, this is uh, uh, a personnel decision that uh, Danny Machocha took. And, and when we, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to him a few weeks ago about choosing David Cote and, and Joseph Zema. And he talked about David Cote just focusing on field goals, that he was a great, great field goal kicker. And if he could focus just on that, he'd be good. And since the start of the season, he's been pretty good. The problem has been the long snapping. The long snapping uh, on the two field goals he missed, the, the snaps were bad. Um, so you can't have that. Martin Vidal was, was cut and released. I don't think he missed a snap in his career. So I, I don't know if he's giggling at home, if he's sad or how he's seeing this, but... Um, it's kind of ironic that you, you cut the guy and then his replacement misses a few snaps. Now, they changed this, the holder this week, so it's not going to be Joseph Zemma holding the ball. It's going to be Matt Shield, so that might help. But, but you need a long snapper that's consistent uh, in all three phases. So hopefully we get that. But I, I have no problem with two kickers in Montreal this week. Well, here's hoping that uh, Pierre Lucaron gets it figured out because, yeah, the, yeah, it was it was tough to watch that first game in Edmonton. A couple of those punts I thought were going to sail right over Zima's head, and it just uh, yeah, I, I want yeah. I wanted to say it was just opening day jitters, you know, playing for the new team and all that. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something that's it's got to be settled down, and hopefully he'll he'll get it figured out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah hopefully. Uh, here, here's my last question to you before uh, I'll let Cliff finish this yeah. up. Obviously, when you were playing and in, in all the years that you've been in. Uh, you know, in television, you've seen the issues that the Alouettes have had with at quarterback ever since AC left. In mm-hmm. your opinion, what what does VA have that the other quarterbacks after AC didn't have? Oh, uh, that's a that's a really good question. That's a really good question because finding good quarterbacks in professional football is hard everywhere. I mean, it's not just tough in the CFL. It's tough to find good quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, you're 32 teams, and, and everyone wants to be in quarterback a quarterback in the NFL when they're kids. But to, to be able to groom one and, and get to play pro football and and, and uh, being good at it is very very difficult. I think one thing that he has now is he's had experience enough, and he's had enough opportunities to learn that being a professional football quarterback uh, demands lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of work. Mm -hmm. It it is a cerebral game. You need to be in there the earliest you can in the morning before everyone else. And you absolutely have to be the last one to leave every day. It's, 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 it might be unfair, you know, it might be unfair for him having to put more time in, but that's just the nature of the position and of the sport. And VA took a few years to learn that, but now I really do feel like he understood what the level of implication and work is towards being a good quarterback in the CFL. That's maybe opposite to a lot of guys who came in. Uh, I think of Rakeem Cato. Um, I think of uh, Nathaniel Pipkin, Jonathan Crompton. Uh, I mean, the list is, goes on and on and on. But mm-hmm. I, I, I do think that uh, in the guys, there are a few guys in there who didn't understand 
some guys did. The guys who understood back in the days, the other quarterbacks, well, they didn't maybe have the same skill set. Vernon Adams has a great, great skill set. Throws a good ball. He can move. He's elusive. Um, so he has a skill set, but he also has the leadership and the knowledge now that he needs to put the work in. So I really think he's not Anthony Calvillo. We can't put him in the same category, category, but we can put him in the category of, of a professional quarterback who's understood he needs to be a pro. Uh, and he definitely has the skill set to succeed. Uh, I do see this guy having, and he's just 28, which is young when you see the, the quarterbacks in the CFL nowadays who are playing around 34, 35. Yeah. Uh, if he can give us another 10 years of good football, we're lucky to have him. He's well established. He'll be there for a number of years. Now he needs to, to play smart, continue to do what he's doing. Uh, and I'm here, sure he's going to be a, a great quarterback for this uh, franchise for a number of years to come. Do you see uh, other big name quarterbacks in the CFL doing what VA did this off season? Because in my opinion, and I told Cliff this a couple of weeks ago, him having that mini camp of his that he invited the wide receivers to Seattle, I think has made mm-hmm. a huge, huge difference. And I, I can actually see like a Bo Levi or some of the others in the States doing the exact same thing in the off season next year. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, that's what I'm talking about being a pro like so he's he's preparing he has a skill set and he needs to be a leader yep. and that's what I really think he he improved and grew and matured as a player the past year he matured as a leader he's doing all the small things go to practice you'll see him bring water bottles to the backups like during Skelly or whatever like he's he's really taking his role to heart mm-hmm. uh, and doing things like that bringing in the guys if the quarterback's bringing me to his house to train, I'm going to respect that guy regardless of what he does. And if he does a mistake, I'm not going to take it up on him. I'm going to say, okay, I got your back because you had mine. Yep. So ha- making moves like that and, and making decisions and, and showing that leadership, go, it goes a long, long way in the locker room. So, yeah, um, it, it was great to hear. And I'm sure it's not the last of these sessions. Uh, I think he's going to set a standard for him and maybe, like you said, for other quarterbacks in this league. For sure. Cliff. All right. Well, Matt's here. Uh, we, what, wow. What a, what a trip you've taken us on this evening. It's been absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, we've covered so much and we definitely appreciate everything you've done. I want to ask you though, you're a back-to-back champion with the Laval Rouge all back-to-back mm-hmm. champion with the Montreal Alouettes. Now in media, there's no real championship other than like a Gemo award. Do you think you ever go yeah. back-to-back on a Gemo award? Yeah, well, I got one, <laughs> but I didn't go back to back because I won two years ago and I didn't win last year. But I'm in nomination this year again. So who knows? Who knows? Hey, and you know what? I don't really care because I'm lucky enough. I played football for a living and now I talk football for a living. So I'm pretty, pretty blessed. I'm pretty lucky. I got two beautiful girls. I, I would say I went back to back on my girls. There you go. They're pretty, they're pretty awesome. Uh, so no, I'm just blessed. You know, I, I started playing football when I was 18. I started playing football when I was 18 years old. That's crazy. It changed my whole life. Everything I am that I do now is related to football, which is crazy. So I'm just so, so happy. Um, so grateful for all these opportunities I had as a player uh, and now in the media. Um, to, to, to have the opportunity to, to live my life because of football. And as long as I can do it, I'll do it. Uh, it's a passion of mine. And hopefully I get to transmit that passion to people who listen to me uh but yeah it's uh, i've been pretty lucky in my life and hopefully uh the the, the, the stars the, and the, the sky shines on me for a long time again because i'm pretty blessed to be able to be in a position i am today well that's incredible and uh folks if even if you don't understand french like i'm talking about the rest <laughs> of canada here you got to tune into matt's here just you, you see his energy you see everything that he brings to rds for these uh, cfl pregame shows i mean it's, it's infectious so you, you get a chance tune in check him out matt's here where can we find you on social media uh yeah i'm pretty active on twitter so twitter is the place you're going to find me matt Chipu, m-a-t-t-h-i-e-u-p-r-o-u-l-x so i'm i'm there i'm not I have a Facebook and an Instagram, but don't don't even bother going there. I'm not on there. It's, uh, <laughs> I don't I, I don't get it. I can't I can't get hooked on it. So yeah, Twitter's a good place to, to spot me and come and ask your questions and talk with me. It'd be a pleasure. All right, there you go, Matsier. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Alouettes Flight Deck. We definitely appreciate it. We're looking forward to having you back on again real soon. Sounds Thanks good, again. guys. Take care. Th- thanks for inviting me. Always great to talk to anyone who used to play for the Alouettes. It's it's uh. 
interesting, interesting to see about his uh, transition to RDS, uh, to hear about his actual, his full-time career. Because, uh, you know, bringing up, it's funny, Cliff, you bringing up the amount of players, uh, former players on the Alouettes that have become lawyers is, is mind-boggling. I guess I guess if we get ourselves into a little bit of trouble, uh, hopefully uh, uh, Alowitz Lawyer Nation has our back. Well, absolutely. And uh, Marco Briette has told me on occasion, like, uh, if you need legal counsel, I'm your guy. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's one of the things. It's one of those nice things to have in the back of your pocket if you ever uh, and you hope to never ne- have to need it. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's incredible. And to hear Matt's here talk about that and just you know. You know, the passion you can hear in his voice for the Alouettes and for the CFL is tremendous. And I, I tell you what, RDS is very lucky to have him on board. And, you know, we definitely appreciate him coming on the flight deck tonight to talk with us. And as always, anytime you want to come back on, Matt's here and chat with us, you've got a spot open here. Exactly. Uh, before we head off to talking about uh, what's coming up for the Alouettes, we want to remind everybody that you can check out our archive. It's every single episode that we've done over the past six years here at the Flight Deck. If you head over to www.alouettesflightdeck.ca, you can check them all out from day one to today. Uh, also, if you want to check us out on social media, you can check us out at Alouettes FL Deck. You can check out Cliff at, at Cliffy D. You can check out myself at Repack, R E P P A C T. Um, and also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Cliff, we're, we're, besides our main website, we're also available other places on the on the net, aren't we? Well, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts, uh, pretty much you name it, type in the, the search for Alouette's Flight Deck, and chances are you're going to find us. And best of all, if you're not into Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any of those things, if you'd rather just you know jump onto YouTube and check out the Flight Deck, you can certainly do that as well. Same idea. Type in the search Alouette's Flight Deck and boom, you've got full interviews. We've got all sorts of stuff that we got planned that we want to get out and put onto their YouTube page. Please, folks, throw us those likes, subscribe, check us out, give us thumbs up, thumbs down if you really have to. But uh, <laughs> come and interact with us. We, we want to make this YouTube page something really special. Like I said, we've got some big plans that we'd like to do with it, and uh, we need your support for that as well. So please come go onto YouTube.com, search for Alouette's Flight Deck. You'll find us. Check out the interviews. Some great stuff. Yeah. Um, as of this taping right now, the Alouettes are a home underdog to the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And I think that's really by, I, I guess I would say it's by reputation only. And, it, I, you know, it looks like the, the bookies are, are, sports books are not caring if they're 0-2 or not and don't care who's starting. But in your opinion, Cliff, you know, it's funny. For the second week in a row, the Alouettes, uh, the Alouettes find out that the quarterback they thought was going to be starting for them for their opponent did not now actually it's almost identical because they knew about Bo Levi Dane um uh, Mazzoli was on the injury report for most of the week because of, of a rib issue um and then it was announced today that Dane Evans is going to start so is this a sign that the Alouettes need to change you know let's say we went to it last week I'm hoping that they are not too cocky on this one because you know, the difference between, you know, Calgary's backup and Hamilton's backup are, are slightly different. Just a little bit different, considering that this backup for Hamilton uh, kind of took the team to the Grey Cup. Mm-hmm. I mean, this isn't this isn't a, a no-name rookie. This is a, an actually established CFL quarterback who's won against the Alouettes at least twice, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to me, I mean, this, this is not a gimme by any stretch of imagination. Yes, there's some injury concerns for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Uh, Guys like uh, Brandon Banks haven't been quite playing up to their potential. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, on, again, on paper, and I always say on paper because you know, <laughs> we know games are not played on paper. This has all the the earmarks for a dominant Alouette's win, but you still got to play the game. And I, I think last week, if nothing else, definitely brought the Alouettes down to earth, which in a small way I think is good because I think that means they're not going to take – Hamilton lightly they can't afford to I mean just because they're 0-2 doesn't mean anything because if anything they're gonna be hungry as hell to get that first win and if they can spoil Montreal's homecoming party in order to do so I think that's just extra motivation for them to me I think uh, Montreal cannot afford to take them lightly and I think they have to uh, approach this game all gas no breaks like they've got to be able to do what they did against Edmonton just punch Hamilton in the face repeatedly and make the point that this is a much better football team. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the Owls are 
you know, they're five and five over their last 10 games with Hamilton at home. You know, they, they've really owned Hamilton in Montreal in their history. Um, Mm -hmm. but again, you know, any, we've seen what happened with, I'll say, I I still got to say it because it did happen. I mean, you had Johnny Manziel come in and, and look what happened in that game. Uh, it's just, yeah. So they need to take this game very seriously again. And also it's a divisional game. This is this was the team that the that the most of the pundits were saying was the team to be even us. We said the exact same thing. Yeah, that, they, that they're the team most likely the team to beat in the East. Yeah, they, their reputation definitely preceded them. Like they again, you saw the moves they made during the off the very, very long off season. I mean, they made as many moves as possible to ensure that they were going to stay on top of the CFL East. And despite this surprising 0 two start. I still think once they get everything sorted out, I mean, this is still a very dangerous football team and cannot be taken lightly by any stretch. Yeah, This is why I definitely think Montreal, they know they can win. They know they have what it takes to win football games in this league. They just got to go out and execute. We, we, we said it before, but it, it's really true. They really do have to go out and execute. Like, they cannot take any plays off. They cannot get lackadaisical. Even if they get out to another 14-3 to lead, like, you got to keep the pressure on and just make smarter plays. Like, just... You know, you, you, you know, you've seen the scouting. You've seen what they've they've done against Winnipeg and against Saskatchewan, two very tough and two very good teams as well. I'll say Montreal is has the talent to be in that conversation along with Winnipeg and Saskatchewan. But yeah, for, for you got to, sure. but you got to make it happen. Simple yeah. as that. And, and I think and stop I, I the think penalties. Of, cut them in half. Cut them by three fourths. Easily, easily. And again, we said it. We know Vernon knows what it takes to win. I, I want to believe he's going to make a lot more smarter decisions this week. I think he's going to definitely see the field. And I think just being at home as well, playing in front of his fans is going to make a huge difference. I think he's going to want to put on a show. I think he's going to want to prove that he definitely belongs in the conversation as far as being in that upper tier of quarterbacks in the Canadian Football League. Exactly. And and a dominant performance against Hamilton will prove that. That will help, I think, silence any critics that he has. And I don't see too many of them. I'll be honest. I don't see too many. Some people kind of question his decision-making ability, but I think for the most part, people know what Vernon Adams is at this point. Yeah. And he's just got to go out and do the thing. Simple as that. Yep. And I think the main thing, though, for us is that we're, we're glad to have a home game back. It's going to be great to see everybody, whether we're social distance or not. Whether we are 9,000 strong, whether we are 12,500 strong, or whether we are 20,000 strong, we, we know what it's going to be. I mean, I'm just, you understand what I'm saying. We're, oh, we're, yeah. we're just glad that we're going to be back. And what I thought was very interesting is what's being offered by the Alouettes over the next couple, you know, over the home games for the 2021 season. Yep. Um, I think what's pretty cool Home opener being presented by Telus. They're gonna have a, a, a halftime show uh, by Creative Labs Sound and Lighting. Um, I'm I'm curious to know because as you and I have seen Cliff throughout sports now, especially in baseball, you know when a team is playing under the lights and stuff like that. If, if a team hits the, hits a homer, they're now able to make the lights do different things. You know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if they can do that at McGill, but I'm curious to see what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, DJ, we're having had in-house DJs before. Some of them been pretty bad. Some of them been okay. Uh, they're having a cowbell giveaways, which are sponsored by Telus. Um, Budweiser night for nine dollars. You can actually pre-order them. That <laughs> never <laughs> seen that before because I know the Alouettes. I think at one point wanted to have an app where you could order your food to your to your seat, but you can actually go to the website and pre-order your nine dollar beers because it is they're bringing back the Budweiser Friday night lights. Uh, games uh, mm-hmm. and, and also they're going to be honoring frontline workers uh, next as, home, as they should yeah I, I completely agree uh, Thanksgiving uh, presented by Nolan Orr uh, they're going to be a ceremony to honor Mart Levy's induction into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame very we cool don't, we don't know if he's even coming or not uh, but celebrating our armed forces and another flyover by the way people who are complaining about continuous yearly flyovers by the uh, uh by the Canadian Air Force, you now know. So don't get a tizzy. It's happening as long as the weather stays nice. So I guess you can complain about it now. But you know what? I'm sure they will, Cliff, they will complain about it then no matter what. It's like, I was so scared and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we'll, we'll put out another warning the, the episode before Thanksgiving. Yeah, we'll, just put, to, yeah, we'll put out a memo. We'll yeah, all, out. You pearl, all you pearl clutchers, just you know, That's right. take a seat, relax, settle yes. down. <laughs> yeah. October 22nd. Uh, a ceremony honoring Michael Souls. Love this. Love this. 
pre-ordered beer. It sounds so weird. It's pre- <laughs> pre-ordered beer. Uh, October 30th, fan appreciation game, and they're honoring John Bowman. It's funny. We were talking to, to Bowman a few weeks ago, and either it was not he didn't know about it or couldn't let on about it. This is cool. Or maybe it was just Merrick just confirming everything. So, I mean, yeah. especially too, like since he'd already gone back to the States, maybe he wasn't sure. Maybe the, the team wasn't too sure what the, this it may have been decided before all the restrictions got lifted as far as people coming in from the United States to it's Canada. True. So it's true too. Um, Very possible. So out of curiosity in your, I don't know, actually there's a couple questions I'll ask here. Uh, they'll be giving out gifts. You, it's also Halloween weekend. So you can come wearing your costume. I will come dressed as a fan with a mask on. Um, the family game. They're bringing back the family games. That's, I love that. Uh, Saturday, 1 p.m., November 13th at 1 p.m., $5 admission for youngsters in certain seating categories. Entertainment geared towards uh, our young fans. I just can't wait to see Paw Patrol. You know, Paw Patrol and... Uh, uh, Ninja Turtles? Ninja Turtles. Uh, here's a, Maybe Carmen Sandiego. Uh, well, we won't be able to find her, though. Because, you know, where in the world is Carmen Sandiego? Isn't maybe, she right next to Waldo? Uh, <laughs> I was about to say that. Maybe she's with Waldo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in your going back to these two celebrating uh, for for Marv Levy and for John Bowman, mm-hmm. and we know nothing about this, by the way. So we're just we're we're spitballing here and we're guessing here. Do you think that they would put Marv Levy, his I guess just his name since he doesn't have a number? Do you think they would put his name on the Wall of Honor and? Bowman, do you think they will retire his number? No, because nobody's wearing seven this year. No, I, th- I think they are get doing it as I had hoped. That they're they seem to be doing a bit of a moratorium on his number. Uh, but again, when it comes to the retiring numbers, it's always such a tricky thing nowadays because yeah. you know, with football being such a big sport and with so many numbers in use, it's you know you got to be careful when it comes to when it comes to retiring numbers. So I. Uh, I definitely think he needs to be honored. He definitely deserves the opportunity to have a proper goodbye with his fans. Uh, but, I, but honestly, I'd be shocked if they retired his number. Not, I'm not saying he doesn't deserve it. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I, I just don't think that would happen. And also, too, if they were to retire his number, I think it would be something just, you know, another event that you can plan for months in advance and do something really special for him mm-hmm. in order to honor it. Just like they did with uh, AC and uh, and Cahoon. Yeah, but I mean, I, I said I, I mean, it would be cool as hell to see, but uh, I just don't think it would, I don't think it's going to happen this year. Yeah, but but I mean, again, I've been wrong before, but I just personally don't see it happening. It'd be it'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I couldn't think of a better way to honor a a great Alouette like John Bowman, but I just don't see it happening myself this year. But do you think that they would be? Is it because it usually coincides with going into the Hall of Fame and stuff like that? Do you think they would put Mar? Uh, they would quote unquote retire you know what i mean since he doesn't have yeah, a number do you think they would uh put Mar- Le- marv levy's name on on the wall of fame or whatever they're calling it for players they they wrote that wall of honor the i don't know what they call it ring, the ring of fame or yeah, yeah, yeah something like honor. that you think yeah. they would do that oh uh, maybe uh i mean people know what marv levy is all about uh i mean he definitely deserves his accolades and the yellow what's worked really hard to yeah promote his like campaign for him to get it nominated into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Uh, retiring his, well, at least honoring his, like somehow honoring his name as part of the field would be, I think it would also be very cool. Well, it's kind of uh, kind of the thing, remember, didn't the Jays do that with Cito Gaston, if I'm not mistaken? And because he didn't technically have a number, I mean, but yeah, that's one example I could give because I know the Canadians have retired, I think, just all player numbers, I think. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> You know, so I would think if Marv is there, if he's able to make it, I, I really, th- I, I'm going to stick with my guns here, and I'm going to, I'm going to say right now, I think, I think they're going to put his name up on the uh, on the Ring of Honor. As I said, it would be very cool because he, he would be the first to have that, the first, you know, no name to be up there without a number. Yeah. So I think it would be, it would be different, and I think it'd be kind of welcome actually yeah i mean like i said like we know what he did with the alouettes he was a crucial part of their of two of their great cup championships i mean yeah i mean I, I would not be mad at all to see him be honored like that yeah um but yeah uh, as i said all this is listed on the alouettes website at uh, montreal um and check it out because you know, we're, we're 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 psyched and as a surprise for those of you who happen to listening all the way through this to the podcast this week as a surprise 
in honor of the Alouettes returning to Percival Molson for the first time in oh so many days. We're going to be giving you a, a limited time promo code for our store, which you can access at uh, teespring.com slash store slash Al's Flight Deck. If you use the code Home Opener, you'll get 21% off for, for between Friday and, su- and Friday and Sunday. Home Opener is the code, 21% off over at our store. So we hope to see you there at Percival Molson. We're so excited. Cliff, you'll be right next to me. It's going to be great. So everybody here at the Alouette's Flight Deck, for Cliffy D, I'm Tim Capper. We're on final approach.